Hello everybody, so we're finally going to finish off this unit talking about the Gilded Age and the Progressive Era by making connections to Jim Crow. So before we get started, I think it's helpful to snapshot the different accomplishments of the progressive presidents and just highlight this bit right here. When we are, ref when we are thinking about the Progressive Era, there isn't much attention towards efforts of Black Americans to achieve full equality. So that's what this video is going to be getting into. And we should first pay attention to this major landmark Supreme Court decision called Plessy versus Ferguson. What this effectively did was it said that segregation was constitutional across the entire United States. So this was an 1896 decision that upheld a Louisiana law that required racial segregation of railroad facilities. And the Supreme Court ruled using the 14th Amendment, this part of it called the Equal Protection Clause, to say that so long as facilities were equal, that it was constitutional for them to remain separate. And that became known as the Separate but Equal Doctrine. The plaintiff in this case, Homer Plessy, who you see on the right, was one-eighth Black. And he, so he was typically seen as passing for white. And he sat in the only white train car in Louisiana attempting to test the Constitution constitutionality of this law ultimately he was arrested and the supreme court sided seven to one against plessy and again as i said before this legalized segregation in all publicly owned facilities so other things like buses and of course schools and even private facilities were segregated and they used this separate but equal doctrine to sep to, to um rather support this segregation and Plessy versus Ferguson was the law of the land until 1954, when it was overturned by the Brown versus Board of Education decision. So I'm not going to read both of these opinions, but I think it might be helpful for you to pause and also at the very least read the emphasized portions to get a sense of the constitutional rationale. And then I also want you to take a moment to pause and read the sole dissent by Justice Harlan, which was later used in the Brown versus Board ruling to strike down the separate but equal doctrine. Let's turn into, or rather transition to debates about education by thinking about the opinions of Booker T. Washington and W.E.B. Du Bois. So first, they both had very different backgrounds. Um, Booker T. Washington was born into slavery in 1856, and even though he was emancipated less than a decade later, he grew up in dire poverty, and that ruled out options for high-quality education. He did eventually, though, enroll in a historically Black college called the Hampton Normal and Agricultural Institute. This was a historically Black college that was founded pretty early on in 1868, by the by the Freedmen's Bureau to provide education for African Americans because those educational opportunities were far and few between prior to the 13th and 14th and 15th amendments. So Washington's educational background led him to promote economic progress within a segregated system. Washington later on went to found the Tuskegee Institute in Alabama and this is also a historically black college and its goals were similar to the Hampton Normal and Agricultural Institute. That was to provide vocational and technical training. And Booker T. Washington's autobiography called Up From Slavery essentially touted these ideas that the goal for African-Americans should be economic self-sufficiency. And it is okay for this to occur within the status quo of segregation. And these ideas were later rejected by W.E.B. Du Bois the man you see on the right, who favored a more progressive approach towards education and equality. So again, I said these two men had quite different backgrounds. Like I said before, Booker T. Washington was born into slavery, and W.E.B. Du Bois was born free in Great Bar Barrington, Massachusetts in 1868. And he also received a very high quality advanced education. He was the first black man to receive a PhD, I believe it was in sociology, from Harvard. And his call for social equality led him to participate in the founding of anti-racist uh, organizations such as the NAACP, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, which I'll talk about more in the next slide. 
And W.E.B. Du Bois's book called The Souls of Black Folk, which was published in 1903, rejected, explicitly addressed and rejected Booker T. Washington's approach towards a vocational and technical education system and economic improvement within segregation. And W.E.B. Du Bois called for more progressive reforms and full equality under the law. So I just mentioned the NAACP. Again, Du Bois was one of the founders. So let's get into a little bit more detail with that. So there was a movement that's also important to mention that preceded the NAACP. This was called the Niagara Movement. And this uh, was active between 1905 and 1909. Uh, it was an interracial, interracial organization that was attempting to put legal pressure um, on various segregationist systems to overturn them. But the NAACP was much larger. This was founded in 1909. Most members of the Niagara Movement also had founding roles in the NAACP. The NAACP was also an interracial organization and they even more with their power and resources used the legal system to try to end racial segregation. So they wrote many briefs and lobbied and took certain laws through the court systems. They were able to strike down certain segregationist laws far earlier than the Brown v. Board decision, which they also had a pivotal role in. I already mentioned that Du Bois was a founder. Another noteworthy founder was Ida B. Wells, famous anti-lynching advocate and journalist. Thurgood Marshall, a prominent attorney for the NAACP, went on to become the first Black Supreme Court justice of the, of the U.S. And the NAACP um, used extensive lobbying techniques to advocate for anti-lynching legislation in the 1920s and 30s. That legislation ultimately stalled, unfortunately, in Congress, but nonetheless, the NAACP used this influence and continued to gain support and members, added new chapters all over the country, and these legal efforts helped pave the way for the modern civil rights movement of the 1950s and 60s. Again, I said earlier that the NAACP's funding and legal expertise was ultimately what led to the Brown versus Board decision making it to the Supreme Court. And certainly it was what led to the unanimous ruling that struck down school segregation in 1954. The NAACP is still active today and it has over 2000 chapters and half a million members worldwide. So let's evaluate just for a moment before we conclude. Typically, when we're studying the progressive era, there is not much attention paid towards civil rights and towards major African-American political progressives. I want us to challenge some of that, but also acknowledge that in the political front, there was not much progress. I would say, though, there's major progress just in terms of long-term success and social mobilization. So why is there not much political progress? A lot of that is because there are two mainstream political parties, neither of which particularly prioritize racial progress. President Wilson, for example, was openly racist, so he is not going to give much credence to the words of someone like W.E.B. Du Bois. But the NAACP, again, founded in 1909, expands very, very considerably over time. And this leads to major political gains in the mid 20th century, like the Brown versus Board decision. And also, this is a period where we see growing influence of black intellectuals. I already mentioned W.E.B. Du Bois. The man you see here on the upper right was Carter G. Woodson, who helped bring about Negro History Week, which was a effort that was purely founded in academia. And then later this evolved into what we celebrate now is Black History Month. And right now I'm recording this video in the month of February. So we are right now observing this month. So we should know who Carter G. Woodson was because Black History Month arguably would not have unfolded the way that it did without his efforts as an academic. Black soldiers during World War I often remarked that they were treated better by their French and British allies. And so this leads them to continue to push for more civil rights policies and full equality after the war. We read in class an excerpt of a, uh, of a piece of work by W.E.B. Du Bois encouraging black soldiers to fight against things like lynching after returning home from fighting on the front lines. He argued that if they could fight for their country and be treated equally 
in terms of their ability to be drafted, then they should also be treated equally under the law. And this is a tense period after World War I because the KKK is experiencing a period of resurgence. So this is a very, very tense time for race relations. But nonetheless, I just mentioned Negro History Week. I forgot to mention when it was established. This was in the 1920s. So you see that there, there's this, it, it's difficult, right, to, to truly capture whether or not this is a period of progress for Black Americans or a continuation of that nadir of race relations where things are not particularly good or progressive for Black Americans. So we're going to continue talking about this, the evolution of civil rights, and many, many other topics that are rooted at the turn of the 20th century. So again, this video hopefully touched upon these Last two questions, if you did not catch the response to environmental progressivism, that is the previous video, so I encourage that you check that out. And also check out all the videos from this unit if you're studying the Gilded Age or the Progressive Era. So links to that entire playlist are embedded right here. Feel free to click on that. And thank you so much. I hope all these videos were helpful, and I'll see you soon.